And we're going to continue in the Gospel of Luke this morning. Recall we are spending some time uh, with Luke's parables, parables unique to Luke, uh, and a few that aren't so unique. Uh, The one we are uh, looking at this morning in Luke 16 is unique uh, to Luke's Gospel. um, Jesus is addressing the disciples, but we know the Pharisees are listening in. They're within earshot of what Jesus is saying about the values of the kingdom. Um, Will those listening align with the king? and what it is he loves, and what it is he values. Uh, the king is present in their midst. And, um, and this, is, this is coming on the heels, Luke chapter 15 here, of uh, some familiar stories, the story of the prodigal sons and the lost sheep and the lost coin, where Jesus is really pleading with the more prideful, self-righteous, uh, elder brother type Pharisees, to repent, to turn from their ways, to turn and look to Him. Join the party um, of those who uh, celebrate with the Father. Um, and now he's going, to, uh, he's going to mention something else that is contributing to their inability to see and to hear um, and accept the gift of God uh, to them. And I'll admit right up front that well, what we're going to read in Luke 16 here, it's not... It's not easy to understand. It's a challenging parable, which is kind of funny, coming off of some of the most popular um, stories in Luke's gospel. Uh, but we get enough, enough detail, or Jesus shares enough in that culture, in that context, that those with ears to hear uh, can understand um, the message. So Luke 16, I'm going to read through uh, verse 15. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg." I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down, quickly write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful... In the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This is God's holy and enduring word to his people. Would you pray with me? Speak, Lord, as we come to you in these moments and in this place. Speak to our hearts and our minds a word that we need to hear a word that instructs us on what it looks like to follow you faithfully as disciples. Lord, you know what it is we need to hear this morning, and so we ask that you would teach us, that you would imprint the truth of this word upon our hearts, that we would be diligent and faithful and attentive in listening. And Whatever is said that may be unhelpful or untrue, that you would block that out you would speak as you have promised to 
through your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think it's going to surprise any of you this morning. I say that we live in a culture of consumption. Uh, as Americans, we are really consuming just about anything that we can, um, anything that we believe is going to make us happy or make life a little bit easier, that's going to relieve any pain or hurt. Um, we'll consume what we can, kind of as a smokescreen even, to cover our sin or dissatisfaction. Uh, the time we spend in front of screens. I'm just going to hold up my phone, but thankfully I don't have it in my pocket. It's somewhere else. Um, but phones or computers or, or TVs, you know, that endless bombardment of consumption. Take, take, take. Um, things we often don't need, but as consumers, we are takers. Some interesting facts here. I, I found this interesting. Um, 65%, this may be a little bit old news, 65% of young adults, we're talking 18 through about 24, say that shopping and buying things is their number one joy, their number one pleasure. Um, and about 50% say that what they own speaks to how well they're doing in life. So the stuff is success, and success is the stuff. Which is also why, when you think about that, why we have over 2 billion square feet of storage space not in homes uh, in this country. Now the size of the average home, again, there's a lot of data, but the size of the average home has doubled in the last couple of decades. And yet, um, half of those who rent storage units are, say we can't fit this in our house. So this, this larger percent of, of storing things that we no longer need or want. And I say all this not uh, to make us feel guilty uh, or to shame us, though there may be a place for a little conviction. Um, but the greater concern here is that we don't appear all that concerned with our consumerism. Uh, you know, we're, we're fixated on the stuff, acquiring the stuff, and so to do that, we need money, uh, or pretend money. And so money then becomes sort of our focus, attention. It be easily becomes the devotion of our hearts. Even if we can somehow resist this modern consumer mentality, and we try to live within the means that God has uh, provided, we're still thinking about money. Well, how, how do I live within this, this budget? Or how, how do I tighten things up in this way? So the money is still on our minds a lot of the time. Um, and it so easily grasps our hearts. And so Jesus shares a story here. Uh, the allure of the possessions, security that we think we have in those possessions, but also the consequences of how uh, we use this stuff. And so I want to do a compare and contrast here. I think it's a helpful way to draw out these lessons. Comparing and contrasting the actions of this master and his manager uh, to the life and goals of the disciple, to you and I. So the master here, the rich man, uh, he's preparing to fire this uh, manager. This guy would be considered the broker of, uh, of his goods. He has control of his property, business transactions, and now he has to give an account of how he has gone about this work. Now notice, he didn't make any excuses after he was called out. He doesn't confess anything. He says, I'm going to get fired. What should I do? And we're told in verse 8 that he's a dishonest manager, which probably shouldn't surprise us by that time. He's getting fired. That's uh, so what got him into trouble in the first place. So life ahead now for this dishonest manager, it doesn't look real good. He's likely too old to be in that place where he can make a living with manual labor. Uh, the last thing he wants to do is beg uh, would be a life of poverty, life of shame for him. So he decides to use this remaining time as the manager uh, to his advantage. I may get fired, but at least I'll have some you know, wealthy friends who will have my back. Uh, so he's dishonest, but he's no dummy for sure. He sees what's coming, and he takes decisive action. Doesn't wait around, doesn't play the lottery. Well, let's see what happens here. No, he really gets down to business. Sneaky, shrewd business. But he knows his days are short. Um, 
Now, we're not holding out this man as, as a moral example here. It's not the intention, I believe, of Jesus. But he's using the wealth of his master to make provision for his life, however short or long that may be. Uh, and important you know, comparisons here for us when we consider that, that one day every human being is going to stand before the master, the master of heaven and earth. And it's a little hard to determine in reading through this parable if the master here is intended to represent uh, God, but the truth still remains that we all have to give an account to God for how we have managed his money and possessions, just like the, the manager does here. We're, are, is this something we're going to be commended for? Or are we going to be looking at shame? and poverty not just for an earthly lifetime but for eternity Uh, and the reality that we're already looking at poverty and shame in our own sin needs something needs to be done about that Um, so the manager here sees what's coming he prepares for it is that our posture do we prepare for the day that is coming Today, tomorrow, when we will give an account? Um, and how are we preparing uh, for this? Um, it's really amazing how much of our time and energy, how much attention we give to the uncertainties of life now compared to the certainty of eternity. I mean, think about how the you know, insurance businesses work, they're not hurting during this pandemic season. Uh, Think of how we invest in health insurance and disability insurance and dental and home and car and property, all of these things. We insure ourselves against all kinds of disasters, the majority of which we are never going to experience. These things won't happen, but you know what we will experience? Do you know what will happen? We will die and stand before God and give an account. Is he going to find us dishonest and wasteful? Or will we hear, well done, good and faithful servant? You've been faithful with the little that I've entrusted. Or maybe the lot that I've entrusted with you. See what's coming. Make provision. How are we preparing for eternity? As the gospel has worked deeper into our hearts and into our minds, we're overwhelmed at the reality that there really is nothing that we can contribute, nothing that we can buy that is going to secure our souls. No amount of money, no effort can contribute to this. So we rest in Christ. We rest in the magnitude of His grace to us. Because only He uh, satisfies what the law requires. Only He can uh, carry us home. I read in a leadership journal not too long ago. It said, money will buy a bed but not sleep. It will buy books but not brains. It will buy food but not appetite. Finery but not beauty. Money will buy a house but not a home. Medicine but not health. Luxuries, not culture. It'll buy amusements, but not happiness. Buy religion, but not salvation. A passport to everywhere, but heaven. So the money, the possessions that we have cannot secure the future, uh, those things of lasting worth and fulfillment uh, for us. So how should we use the resources? And so this, the, spirit, the, the parable here speaks... Uh, this by way of contrast. Um, in the, the Jewish society of this time, it really was against their law to charge interest uh, on these accounts or on these loans. And yet, many of the businessmen would charge interest anyway uh, to make a profit. So it's possible here, we don't know this for sure, but it's possible that the manager here was simply canceling the interest that had accrued on these loans that shouldn't have been there anyway. 
And so by doing that, you can see how it would work to his advantage and to the advantage of the master. So it's going to make the master look like this really uh, upstanding guy. You know, he's, he's canceled some of that interest. What, what a businessman. Maybe I'll do some business with him again. Uh, but the point is that it was business for, for him. Do what you have to do, manager. Do what you have to do. Do whatever it takes to get more for, for yourself. So the master doesn't commend his dishonesty, but he does commend his shrewdness. So we see this very a self-centered business practice. Do what you need to do to get more revenue coming in for yourself. You see this happen today? Uh, walking through, Katie and I are walking through Barnes & Noble just the other day and you start looking at who's on the cover of different uh, books in the bookstore and you go, wow. You know, this, this person was convicted of unlawful business practices or they spent some time in jail and now there's a book and we put them on TV shows to learn how they did it. We admire them for these things. And this is what we might expect from those who have no desire to follow Christ. They're looking for their, their own self-interest, planning for their own advantage in the here and now. And that's where the contrast comes in. So Jesus is not commending dishonesty here in any way, but the Christian is to prepare for what is to come eternally. By honesty, wise use of the possessions that God has entrusted. So to act shrewdly for the disciple of Christ is to be faithful and prudent with the master's possessions. So did you catch the contrast? Just as the unbeliever is shrewd in pursuit of their own temporary financial future, the Christian is to be wise and faithful in expectation of eternity. The wisdom of this world, consume it all while you can. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself now and the wisdom of God. Use what he's given. Use the temporary wealth to store up this treasure in heaven. Is that, is that a distinction we see in ourselves and among the church? Are we as wise in using the Lord's resources for eternal investment as the watching world is for temporary investments? I think it's a real challenge for us, especially in a time of, of great affluence in the place we live. Um, maybe unroll this here a little more practically. Do we have a budget? And even better, do we stick to a budget? Um, accountable for the dollars, responsible with the Lord's stuff. Uh, are we paying ourselves first? Or are we giving to those in, in need in the work of the church before you know, maybe padding that? Uh, vacation fund or whatever else it may be. Uh, if, if we see no difference with how the world does business uh, and uses the money that they think belongs to them, if we see no difference between that and ourselves. We need to take a closer look. So Jesus makes some conclusions here. Verse 9, verse 11, we read about unrighteous wealth. I think that unrighteous wealth is really the stuff that's burning a hole in your pocket. It's the money. If we seek money for itself and make wealth the goal in life, then, uh, you know, that's, that's an unrighteous goal. Uh, money is not the true riches. Uh, it should be used faithfully unto the Lord. And so the Lord may give very little money. He may give lots of money, but it must be seen as a temporary trust. Luke really spends, he, he, wealth and money, he gives special attention to in his gospel. He sees it as a very prominent idol. Jesus draws attention to this again and again um, in his earthly ministry. How we displace God as the one we worship, as the one that we seek after with the money and the stuff. And our focus and passion becomes um, skewed. You know, I'll just give, give an example of this a little bit in my own heart. A while back, maybe I've shared this before, but a while back in 
watching the, the show Shark Tank. I don't even know if that's still on. I haven't watched it in a while, but I really liked watching Shark Tank. I like watching the, the ideas that these young entrepreneurs would bring before the sharks. What, it is, what did they really need? They needed money. Um, that's what these you know, wealthy business uh, people were for. Um, you know, how, how, but the question they would always ask in every episode was, how do we get our money back and more? Because that was, that was what they were interested in. Um, and after watching the show for a while, I remember uh, Katie asked me one time, why, why do you keep watching that show? Why do you like that show so much? Uh, and I, you know, I, well, I like their ideas and, and uh, just see you know, their savviness in business or whatever. But it got me thinking about why I really liked watching that show. Uh, what, was, what was going on in here? And what I discovered is that there was an allure in my heart just to the, the dollar signs that were being thrown around and saying, well, look at all this money that's there. Uh, look at what's possible. Maybe even I could get in on something like that. Uh, now, I have no intention of going on Shark Tank. I don't have any cool ideas like that. But it's the allure. It's the grip. I mean, when you watch things, you're like, that well, That could possibly maybe be me. Maybe I'll have an idea and I can, you know, make, a, make so much more money. Um, and if you, you kind of ratchet that up a little bit, well, you know, maybe you find yourself walking out of the gas station with more and more lottery tickets or stopping at the casino because the draw, the allure of the wealth and possessions is there. Our hearts cannot handle two gods. Can't. And then that chain, that, that chain may be very thick around our ankles or it may, be, it may be a little smaller, but it's a chain that is very difficult to break. Uh, and the fact is, it won't be broken. That we won't break this, this chain of, of idol worship, and the money and the stuff, unless our hearts are moved by this radical generosity. That's, that's one of the marks of a faithful disciple. Uh, not trapped by temporary riches, but looking forward to and investing in the true riches. Uh, kingdom wealth, deeper knowledge of Christ, walking in grace and truth. And so it's seeing with, with more clarity the generosity of God in Christ. Uh, giving generously because of this. Back in Luke uh, 12, uh, we read this, Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we demonstrate our love for God and really acknowledge that everything belongs to Him when we give generously. Uh, that's the only way to break this chain um, this idol. Hey, this happened for a, uh, a wee little man named Zacchaeus a few chapters later. You remember this? In Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus was shrewd, hoarding as much wealth as he could until he met Jesus. And so when Jesus, when the king himself comes into his home, when the very of joy of salvation has come to him, what do we see him do? He gives. And he gives generously. Not He wasn't compelled, well, I guess I'm following Jesus, so now I've got to get... No, he's, I'll, I'll give, give beyond what was expected. He wanted to do this because the one who was lost was found. And he could take joy in that. So let me ask you this. When you give of your resources, of what, what the Lord has entrusted to you, do you get excited about it? Are you thankful to do that? Or do you get a little bit uneasy? Maybe a little worried, a little anxious. Uh, how much worry is attached to your giving? Because worry is a strong indicator of worship. Um, we only worry about those things that we are afraid to really lose. Um, so if we're worrying about money and really preoccupied with it, that's an indicator. We may not we may be trusting in God to truly care for our needs from day to day. Um, so we don't give because we're afraid then or because we're, we're worried um, maybe we're trusting in those things um, so you and I, I I'm just going to kind of 
end with this. We, we've been made to worship. Um, and God is going to accept no substitutes for the worship of Him. Uh, he loves us too much for that. He knows what it is we need and that we can only be satisfied in Him, in the worship of Him. Um, he will not allow money, He will not allow the mammon to sit on His rightful throne. So the Lord gives us all things to enjoy that we might glorify and enjoy Him more with those things. Um, he gives us the stuff, not just so we can have the stuff, but to enjoy Him, to gain more of Him. How do we do this? By our generosity. By using um, what He's entrusted wisely. Uh, and I'm going to say something here. It may, may be kind of countercultural, going back to our consumerist mentality, things that we wrestle with. Um, but here it is. If you don't use it, you probably don't need it. Um, you say, well, pastor, I, I might need it someday. Um, that's why it's sitting over there in the corner of the garage or in the storage. I might need it. Um, okay. But then maybe when you need it, you could find someone who has it and borrow it. Um, something to think about. How would, our, how would that attitude actually affect this consume it and store it all mentality that we see around us? Um, very well-known uh, quote by a missionary, uh, Jim Elliott. So fitting here. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain which he, that which he cannot lose gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So the sons of this age, they are shrewd, practicing shrewdness and greed. Grab all you can while the grabbing is good. Because um, with that stuff comes, comes the image. You may look good, you may look enviable in the eyes of others, but in the end it means nothing to God. Um, that's how Jesus closes this uh, message. God knows the heart. He knows your heart and mine. He is the only one worthy of our affection and our worship. There, there's no middle ground here. I've been thinking about this morning in Sunday school as, they, as Christian and hopeful were following this way of ease. It, hey, it was parallel with the true way. It looked, it looked right and good. And yet the storms grew on the horizon. Um, so we can serve the money and enjoy what will not last it's gone as quickly as it comes, and it's never enough. Or we can serve God, who gives us all good things to enjoy because He is enough. He is our sole satisfaction, and we want now to give generously for His kingdom purposes. Let's pray together. Lord, we do acknowledge that this can be a hard word to hear and to process. We are so very grateful for the blessings from your hand, for the good things that you give. You are the giver of all good things, and yet so easily, Lord, we turn our hearts towards those good things, grasping after them, grasping for more of them. And yet, Lord, you show us that they cannot satisfy, they cannot fulfill the desires of our hearts. Lord, may we use what you have entrusted shrewdly, wisely, faithfully, not to build bigger barns and store things here temporarily, but investing uh, in what is eternal, investing in uh, what you have called us to as your people, uh, the needs of those around us, carrying one another's burdens, loving each other well um, and sharing this journey of faith. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.